Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What child is this who to rest on Mary's happy sleeping? Who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds call to keeping? Is this his Christ, the King who shall Well, if you take your Bible and join me in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. It's kind of easy to find that one, isn't it? Genesis chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 1 and read through verse 5 today. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 through verse 5. This will take us down through the first day. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. 
Father, help us now as we look at the wonder and grandeur of creation here in this passage and speak to our hearts about it. And Father, give us insight today and courage, Father, to uh, be your evangels in this dark world. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Creation is something that is uh, under attack today, honestly, in the current culture that we live in. Um, and it's under attack in, on many fronts. Scientism is actually uh, becoming a, its own little religion, in America at least. And uh, you, you can see that and hear that in many places. Uh, in the world today. If you just listen to the radio, you'll hear that advertisement. I don't remember who does the advertisement, but they say, uh, in science lives hope. I always scream at the radio when I hear that one because I'll tell it, no, in Jesus there's hope. But they say, in science lives hope because scientism, of course, is the last stand. It's the last place to go if you really want hope. And it's, you know, it's out there. It's, it's becoming... As I said, it's becoming a, its own little religion with its own doctrine and its own confessions, and that's one of the confessions. Along with that is uh, the evolutionary biologist who will say, you know, in evolution lives truth, and they will tell us all about how things sort of progressed, you know, and, uh, and grew by chance, and through the course of, of uh, events, things changed and so forth over billions of years. And if you or I uh, talk about creation as, you know, the act of God, and of course, we, really our language is bound, isn't it? Because when we talk about it, we use the word creation. And when we think about, being, when we think about creation, it has to do with something being created. The world and all of its functions have been created. Uh, and so when the evolutionist uses the word creation, he doesn't really or she doesn't really understand that they're identifying someone as a creator because you can't have a creation without a creator. It just doesn't happen by chance. You're not going to go home today, ladies, and find a nice little hobby project done in your living room all by itself when you left it in pieces last night. That's not going to happen. You'll go home today and you'll put together your little hobby project because you want to do it. And your mind and your heart has set itself on putting that thing together and completing it. And so your creation will be done by a creator, you. It's not going to be done just by chance or happenstance. And I don't care if you give it billions of years, it's not going to come together in its little design. It won't happen. And so when we talk about creation, we always have to think in the background there is a creator. Who is that? Well, the Bible tells us exactly who it is. And I've read for you this morning uh, verses 1 through 5, which takes us down through the first day of creation the end of the first day of creation, but I want to focus my remarks this morning on verse 1. Now, as I've alluded to, uh, creation is not a sidelight doctrine, right? We, it's not over here on the, on the fringe of Christian theology, and we say to ourselves, well, that's, that's nice and everything, but we're not really sure about that. We can't prove any of that, and so we're not going to believe it. It's just over there, and, and it's there. Uh, it's not that. Creation is not a sidelight doctrine. We can't take it or leave it. Rather, creation is the beginning of all of the revelation of God. It is reflected in the creeds and in the confessions of the church. Now, I've just picked out a couple here uh, just as illustration. One of the oldest creeds of the church is the Creed of Nicaea. And in all of its forms, it begins with a statement about creation. The creed says... We believe in one God, the Father, all sovereign, maker of all things, visible and invisible. That's a confession of the church that dates back to the 3rd or 4th century A.D. James Usher, in his Principles of the Christian Religion, said, quote, He did before all time by his unchangeable counsel ordain whatsoever afterwards should come to pass. In the beginning of time, when no creature had any being, God, by his word alone, in the space of six days, created all things. It's James Usher from the Principles of the Christian Religion. The Second London Confession, which informs our Baptist faith and message, says this in chapter 4, paragraph 1, 
In the beginning, it pleased God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the manifestation of the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness to create or make the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. End quote. That is the second London Confession. So you see how important the creation is to the theology of the church, and this is just Honestly, this is a trickle compared to all of the statements that the church has crafted over the centuries about the creation. Now, these are wonderful, and they are the outworkings from the systematic theologies of men. But what does the scripture say about creation? So we just look to the Bible and let the Bible comment on itself. We have my first offering for you is 1 John, or John rather, chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Notice how similar John 1.1 is to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, John starts off. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. So it's, it's fascinating how John ties into that idea that we have here in Genesis chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Then again, if you'll allow me, Hebrews 11 chapter, uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is, above all, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And then I think maybe for me, the penultimate passage in the Bible that speaks of creation other than Genesis chapter 1, if we needed another then, is the, uh, the interview that Job had with God. In Job chapter 38, the Lord said to Job, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? I love that little interview that God gives to Job. And he continues, poor Job, uh, he continues for quite a while with Job, asking him these questions. They're, of course, all rhetorical because we know the answer. We read it and we're going, uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh, because we know who did all these things. God did. He did them all. So let's go back now to Genesis chapter 1, having looked at some of the confessions and a few of the passages in the New Testament and in the Old about creation. And, of course, there are many, many more. If you want to study the subject of creation, I encourage you to do so. If you want to read any of these creeds or confessions, they're easily found online. And I can help you find those if you'd like. I may have some of them myself. And they, they help us understand the idea that God made all things. And it's an important idea. Like I said, it's not a sidelight. It is central to our theology. The beginning. Let's look at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, has a starting point. In our life, the Hebrew word for beginning here in its basic form means the head, the head of, at the head. We could translate it at the head of things, 
you know, that, that's a very wooden translation, but we could do that, at the head of things or in the head of things because that's the basic meaning of this word, but beginning is a better translation. When I was in elementary school, it was important to be the line leader. You know, <clears throat> if you were the line leader, that meant that you had done something good that week in school. And you may have been the line leader for a whole week. And so you, you worked up to being line leader. And it was cool to be the line leader because there was nobody in front of you. You were the one that was taking the class, and everybody followed the line leader. And wherever the class went, the line leader was the one to take them there. And everybody had to stay in line behind the line leader. The only person who was out in front of the line leader was the teacher, and she stood off to the side. But everybody was lined up behind that first person. That was very important. It was the head of the line. And everybody wants to be at the head of the line because, you know, being at the head of the line, head of the line means that everybody follows you. The beginning is the fountainhead of time. When you read this word in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, we have the very start of all time. God did this. He's the one who started the clock, if you will. He uh, was practicing this morning one of the hymns, and I, I couldn't get the timing down right, so I got a little metronome out that I have on my my phone, and I started the metronome up, and it's tick, 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 and I thought, God did that. He's the one that started that. He's the one that put that in motion, the ticking of the clock, the ticking of the metronome, the motion of time. In the beginning, God began time. This word, the beginning, is the fountainhead of all time, but this beginning is also the fountainhead of revelation. This first sentence in the first chapter of the first book of our Bible is the beginning of the revelation of God, where he's telling us about himself. Here the Lord begins to reveal who he is to the men he will make and who and has made. And, what, and who is he when we read this word in the beginning? He's the one who started time. He is outside of time, and that's why he can start time. He is timeless, and so he begins time. And everything, ladies and gentlemen, flows from that. The beginning is the beginning of all things. Without it, there is no first. There is no middle. There is no last moment. Some of you may go home this afternoon and you might watch a ball game, whether it's the Bengals or something else. I don't know if there are any more college games on, but you may watch something on television. And that game will have a beginning, it will have a middle, and it will have an end. And then when you're done, there'll be something else that starts. Maybe your nap. And it'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end. All of those things, your life, Rachel's birthday, Rachel's 19 years old. We count her life in years, days, months, hours, seconds. We can count Rachel's life in all of those ways. And it's because God started things in the beginning. Because Rachel has a beginning, it's because God made a beginning. Rachel will have a middle life. She will have an old life. And one day she will finish this life and go on to the next life. And that will start a new thing. So there's always a beginning. Always a middle. Always an end. Because God made it that way. Every moment of time finds its genesis right here. His sovereign control over all time is expressed in the creation days. For we find the phrase, and the evening and the morning was the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. We find that phrase repeated over and over and over and over. We find it in verse 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, 31, and in 2, 2. This phrase, the evening and the morning were the first days repeated. Why is it repeated? Because God made a beginning. You wouldn't have evening and morning without the beginning. You wouldn't have day one without the beginning. And so you have these six days that began and ended. These are not epochs. These are not eras of time. They are 24-hour days. Because he tells us it was evening, and it was morning. That's how the Jews reckoned time. 
They, they were on a lunar calendar, and so their day began in the evening and ended in the day. And so that's how they reckon time, and that's what we have here. And so we have a 24-hour period reckoned here in the scriptures, and it says it was day one. Where did day one come from? Day one, we just had the beginning, and now God has already set the time. He has set the days. He has set the months. Already in his mind, it exists, and so it is. And so today, we have all of those things that we, how we record time. The evolutionary biologist and the others will tell you, oh, it was billions of years, and these are just epics and so forth. No, no, no. No, these are 24-hour days. How small can God be if we say he had to do it over billions of years? He is the great God, the resplendent one in glory. He could have done it in five minutes if he wanted to, but he did it over six days and then rested on the seventh because that was his will and that was the way that he wanted to reveal himself to us. He is in control over all time in the beginning. He starts it, and ladies and gentlemen, one day, he's the one who will end it. <clears throat> Notice that it says there in verse 1, in the beginning, God. There is no beginning without him. There is no beginning without God. And there is no creative power without God. He is before the beginning, existing, complete, resplendent in glory, righteous, holy, all-powerful, merciful, all-knowing, gracious, and compassionate. He is that before time began. He is that as he starts time. He is that every day during the creation period. He is that today. He, was, he is that with Abraham. He is that with Moses. He is that with David. He is that with the prophets. He was that with Jesus. He is that with the apostles. He is that with the church even today. He is the same yesterday, the Bible tells us, today and forever. God is all of those things. Remember what Paul said in Colossians when he said, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. He's before it, before it. He is preexistent and eternal. Calvin tells the following story. I was reading through institutes uh, preparing for the message, and I found this little story, and it just tickled me. I laughed out loud when I, when I read this. Um, Calvin tells a story. He said, when a certain shameless fellow mockingly asked a pious old man what God had done before the creation of the world, the latter aptly countered that he had been building hell for the curious. <laughs> I don't know. I thought that was funny. The pre-existent and eternal God. What was he doing before he made the world? You see, we, we can't even think about God as timeless, as eternal, without thinking of it in matters of time. What was God doing in, those time, in the time before he created? There wasn't a time before he created the world. It was timelessness, and God was. He is. He is above all of that. And even our language is so weak that we cannot even describe it. But God was before, even though there wasn't a before. God was there, preexistent, eternal. His creative action is witnessed in his speaking in such phrases as, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. We can follow this creative action throughout the chapter as it's repeated with each new day except for day six, and day one, when he creates in day one, the heaven and the earth, and day six, when he creates men. There are three primary uh, vehicle or verbs that act as vehicles for the action in chapter one. The first one is right here in chapter one. It's the word for create. From then on, you have the word to speak or to say and the word to do or to make. And you have those back and forth in all of the verses until you come to day six and when he says let us make man in our image and that word make is the word create it's the same word we have in verse one god is actively working and we can follow this all the way through we can witness this but we never quite really understand it because when we approach the creative moment and we ask the question how all we can say is god did it he spoke it we don't know the devices. We don't know the functions. 
We don't know the tests and the steps. We don't know how he did it. We just know he did it. He made everything. When you ask me the question, how did my wife make that craft? Or how did my wife make that cookie? Or how did my wife make that meal? I could tell you, well, here are the things that she did. I could observe what she did. But really the how is still sort of shrouded from me because it's in her heart. That's where it begins, in her heart. And her mind says to her heart, hey, let's make this. And the creative energy within her puts those things together. She gathers together all the elements that she needs, and then she designs it, whatever it happens to be. You do the same thing. It begins in your heart, and then you engage your mind, and you begin to create, pulling together all the things that you need to make whatever it is that you want to make. But imagine God in eternity past, if we can use that, that weak language, before time began, and he, in his mind, says, I'm going to make, and he's going to create, but he doesn't have anything to gather together. There's nothing. It's just God. And so he has to create the stuff that he's going to use to make everything. And in his mind is the design for everything, for all the systems of the universe, for all the systems of the planet, all the systems that happen in the atmosphere and below the earth, everything. He has a design for all of that, for every creature, for every man, woman, and child, for every horse, bunny, and dog. He has all of that in his mind. For every fish in the sea, for every bird in the air, he knows how they're going to fly. He knows all of that before it was ever anything. We cannot do that. And so when we think about God doing that, we go, how in the world? I don't know. But God does. And God did it. His creative action is witnessed by us. But that's all we can say is that we see it in the scriptures. He speaks it into existence. He makes it, whatever that means. He creates it, and we give thanks because we find it to be good. His care for men is highlighted in this <clears throat> because we find him saying, and God saw the light that it was good. Now, we find that word, uh, we find actually that phrase, God saw whatever, and it was good, is repeated in verse 4, verse 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, and 31. So it's in every day God speaks this word. And then, of course, in 31, it's, and God saw that it was very good. So everything taken together was very good. It was good, not from our perspective, but from his perspective. It was good because God made it. It was good because it glorified him. But this also teaches us about his fatherly love towards us. Let me quote to you from, um, I didn't write the reference down. I believe this is from John Calvin. Now when he disposed the movements of the sun and stars to human uses, filled the earth, waters, and air with living things, and brought forth an abundance of fruits to suffice as foods, in thus assuming the responsibility of a foreseeing and diligent father of the family, he shows his wonderful goodness towards us. He said it was good, and so it is good. And then he made man and set him in a garden, a good garden, because it was filled with good things. Good trees, good fruit, good animals, good soil, good water, good air. It's all good. Good birds in the sky. It's all good. How blessed was Adam in that garden because God had made goodness abundant for him. And what did Adam do with it? The fall ruined the goodness of creation. It ruined the goodness of men. It ruined the goodness of the sky, the birds, the animals on the ground, the goodness of the water, of the light. Everything was tainted by the fall. But God's work was good. He did it in six days. He demonstrates his love. He demonstrates his glory. And we look at it today, as I read in Psalm 8, and we say, O Lord, our Lord, 
How marvelous is your name in all the earth. Verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Notice that last phrase, created the heaven and the earth. This creative act reveals his power and Godhead. Like God, we can create things, but the things we create are limited to time, ability, available material, imagination, as I've already illustrated. God creates things from nothing, which were never before imagined. These things were made from nothing, and the Hebrew tells us, the Hebrews tells us, so the things which are seen were not made from things which do appear. The creation is a permanent witness to his holiness and power and speaks to the world of men that there is a God and they have a responsibility to him. I just, we just studied Isaiah chapter 40 not long ago, back in December. And Isaiah, if I can get my pages to turn here, Isaiah says in chapter 40, this to the men of his time, have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. He shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Here's the Lord speaking. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes upon high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. For he that is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of his understanding. Oh, Isaiah put it to quite a fine point, doesn't he? The one, the holy God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he's the one. And he's the one that men should see. He has made a witness in his creation for all. And of course, then again in Hebrews chapter 1, which I read there at the beginning, verse 20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, they being the men of the world. So how do we, how do we apply these things for ourselves? Well, I want to, uh, I'm going to go to E.Y. Mullins in his, uh, his um, book, The Christian Religion and Its Doctrinal Expression. E.Y. E. Mullins says this, we may sum up the Christian doctrine of creation then in the following statements. So here's Dr. Mullins' way of just sort of reducing all of these things into five easy-to-remember items. Number one, the universe, while distinct from God, originated in his act and is dependent upon him. We don't know about the act, we just know he acted, he created, he made, he spoke. It originated in his act, and is dependent upon him. It exists because he is. Second, in creating the universe, God acted freely and not under necessity or compulsion. God did not need to make the heaven and the earth. He did not need to make the cattle on the ground. He did not need to make the fish in the sea. He did not need to make men. He was complete and whole without any of that. God was not under compulsion and had no need to do it. Thirdly, in creating the universe, God had a view, had in view a moral and spiritual end. A moral and spiritual end of what we just read in Isaiah, for men to worship and acknowledge him. Fourthly, the end of God was the communication of his own life and blessedness to created beings. 
the creation is the revelation of God. It's where we start with the revelation of God to men. We know him because of what he has done. And what he has done is marvelous and it is good. That tells us so much about him. Finally, the fifth thing is the end thus defined was an end begun, carried forward, and is to be completed in Jesus Christ. So it had a beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have an end, and in that end, we will see our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and he will bring all things to completion. And just as it is written, in the beginning, God created, so it will be written, at the end, Jesus reigns. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. As we respond to God today, let us begin with a prayer. Father, we thank you for this moment that we have to consider your creation, its wonder, its glory. Father, your holiness is displayed in it. Your power is clearly seen. We ask, Father, that you would help us as we imagine just what that means for us and for the world. Father, help us to embrace you in all of your creative wonder. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you will, as we respond to the message.